Okay, so my name is uh, Dr. William Newton. I'm teaching in the theology faculty here, and I have the pleasure of in, uh, introducing the two speakers for this session. First, um, we have Dr. Michael Wallstein. He is a professor of theology here at Franciscan University. Uh, I wondered whether I should go through all his qualifications because I didn't want to eat too much into the time uh, for the session, but I will do it. Uh, so he holds a BA from uh, Thomas Aquinas College, a PhD from the University of Dallas, an SSL from the Pontifical Biblical Institute in Rome, and a THD, I don't know if that's how you say it, from uh, Harvard University in New Testament and Christian origins. He previously taught at Notre Dame before serving as the founding president of the International Theological Institute in Garming, Austria, and then went uh, from there in 2008 to Ave Maria University. Uh, since 2018, uh, we've had the pleasure for, uh, of having him here in our faculty, so he's now a professor with us here at Franciscan University. His published works uh, include a critical edition of the four Coptic manuscripts with English translations of the secret book of John, a Gnostic text, um, a new translation of John Paul II's uh, Theology of the Body, and most recently a very uh, scholarly and very extensive, for want of a better word, commentary on that, uh, um, recently published last year, in fact, I think, which is uh, The Glory of the Logos in the Flesh. It's also published numerous articles on the Gospel of John, Gnosticism, Thomas Aquinas, John Paul II, Hans Urs von Balthasar, uh, in journals such as Nova Vetera, Communio Anthropotis, and the Journal of Early Christian Studies. He will speak to us now on the topic of scripture and evangelization in Ratzinger's vision for the church. Please welcome Dr. Michael Waldstein. Thank you very much. Let's begin with the sign of the cross and the glory be. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Today is the memorial of Blessed Karl, the last emperor of Austria, who had an immensely difficult life. If a disaster, if a life full of disasters can be imagined, his was, his was full. But he preserved all through a profound trust in divine providence. His memorial is the day of his wedding. His wife was also extraordinary an official in the Department of the Exterior of Austria, when things looked desperate, said they should commit suicide. And she said to him, if I'm going to hell, I want to go with someone better than you. <laughs> in better company, I think that's the exact, exact, exact word. As theologians, we tend to say words about words, write texts about texts. So it's important also to think about um, the fact that we are animals, depend on our senses. My slides will be accompanied by pictures. The fundamental outline of my talk is in two parts. Part one on Ratzinger's vision. The first section will be mainly on the Regensburg Lecture, and then the two following sections on a masterful essay called The Origin and Essence of the Church. In the second part, I'll try to apply Ratzinger's insights to the Gospel of John. This is the Ghent altarpiece, and I'll use images of the central panel at the bottom. Here, the lamb in the middle, the Holy Spirit on top, various groups around. And then the scene of the lamb at the center on an altar with the blood flowing in the Eucharist. It's important 
it's an immensely beautiful painting. It's apparently the painting most visited after the Mona Lisa in the whole world. But it was an article of use. It was the backdrop of an altar. And the main thing it was for is to serve as a window into what happened in front of it, which is an ordinary mass. First, reason and beauty. This is the Holy Spirit on the very top. So the first series of slides is going to be on the Holy Spirit. In a meeting with clergy in Brixen, in northern Italy, Father Willibald Hopfgartner said, I'm a Franciscan. I'm happy to begin with those words, being at a Franciscan university. I teach in school and work on various leadership tasks in my order. In your Regensburg lecture, you emphasized the essential connection between the divine spirit and human reason. On the other hand, you also emphasized again and again the importance of art and beauty of aesthetics. Next to conceptual speech about God in theology, therefore, should we not again and again place the aesthetic experience of faith anew in the focus of our attention within the church for proclamation and liturgy? This seems to me to apply both to scripture and to evangelization. So these slides about the Holy Spirit in the first section are going to be expanding downward to take in the fuller picture. Pope Benedict's answer, thank you, yes. I believe both belong to each other. Reason, precision, honesty and reflection on the truth and beauty. A reason that would, so to speak, strip off beauty would be a reason cut in half turn blind. Only both together make up the whole, and precisely for faith, this togetherness is important. Then he quotes First Peter, always be ready to give a defense, an apologia, to anyone who asks you for the reason, the logos, of the hope that is in you. Commenting, St. Peter was thus evidently convinced that faith is logos, that it is a reason, in fact, a light from creative reason itself. This is why the faith is universal. This is why it is communicable to all. We're moving down further. You see here behind or between the towers a chain of mountains in the background snow-capped mountains. For me, art and the saints are the greatest apologia for our faith. When one sees the saints, this great track of light that God has drawn through history, then one sees there truly is a strength of the good that endures through the millennia. The light from the light is truly present. Going down further to see the garden in front with the marvelous architecture around. Likewise, when we see the beauty faith has created, these great works of art are luminous signs of God an appearing, an epiphany of God. And in Christianity, it's precisely a matter of this epiphany, that the hidden God became epiphanic, appears and shines. When we fight for the reasonableness of faith in, our, in this epoch, then we fight precisely for the insight that reason does not end where experimental discoveries end, that it does not end in what is positivistic. And that's a lead over to the Regensburg lecture, 
because this is one of the main points of the Regensburg lecture, the self, to overcome the self-limitation of reason. The lamb comes into view here. The geography of the cultural debate. The first circle around the lamb are angels. The Regensburg lecture uses conversion by the sword to draw a contrast between the primacy of will and power, voluntarism, and the primacy of reason, intellectualism. Now, public reactions to the lecture tended to focus on the critique of Islam, conversion by the sword. In fact, however, conversion by the sword only serves in the Regensburg lecture to introduce the main target of criticism, namely, the main target is the self-limitation of scientific reason, scientific rationality, rooted in Western medieval voluntarism. It's clearly the liturgical act. You see the two thuribles in the, in the being swung by angels. This is not from the Regensburg lecture, but complementary, it's very clear, from Spe Salvi. We must look at the foundations of the modern age. These appear with particular clarity in the thought of Francis Bacon, that a new era emerged is undeniable. But what is the basis of this new era? It is the new correlation of experiment and method that enables man to arrive at an interpretation of nature in conformity with its laws and here comes the main point. And thus finally to achieve the triumph of art over nature. Victoria cursus artis supernaturam. The novelty, according to Bacon's vision, lies in a new correlation between science and praxis. That is, science is for progress of the human race, for the betterment of the human condition. This is also given a theological application. The new correlation between science and praxis would mean that the dominion of a creation given to man by God and lost through original sin would be re-established. A complementary text by Descartes, which is also very clear. It is possible to reach knowledge that will be powerfully useful to life. And instead of the theoretical philosophy, which is now taught in the schools, we can find a practical one. The option is very clear here between will and reason. Of course, reason is involved in, in a practical one. By which knowing the force and the actions of fire, water, air, stars, the heavens, and all the other bodies that surround us. As distinctly as we know the various skills of our workmen, we can employ them in the same way for all the uses for which they are fit. And so make ourselves masters and possessors of nature. It's a vast ambition. Now, what are the consequences of this choice of power? It's letting us see the picture a little bit longer. The choice of power, this is now my comment, as the goal of knowledge, leads to the choice of what used to be called mechanics in antiquity, physics in modernity, as the master science of nature. And since the method of physics is mathematical, it shares the limits of mathematics. Mathematics deals only with quantity and with more abstract items in quantitative relations. Goodness, beauty, life, 
consciousness, knowledge, love, male and female, all these cannot be grasped by mathematics. And they tend to be seen as subjective impressions or social constructs. What can be measured experimentally and expressed mathematically, this counts as intelligible, objective, and real. And this is what the Regensburg Lecture calls the self-limitation of modern scientific reason, which had a huge impact, of course, on scripture studies. In this light, Karl Ratzinger reconfigures the conventional geography, as it were, of cultural debate. The conventional geography is this. On the, front, on the one side stands faith, religious faith. On the other, scientific reason. Faith is represented by traditional religions, Islam, Christianity, and it's in support of an anti-liberal politics of repression. Scientific reason, represented by modern natural science, the schools, the universities, the media, is, is in support of a liberal politics of emancipation. The Regensburg Lecture reconfigures this in terms of the distinction between voluntarism and intellectualism. On the one side stands the primacy of reason, represented by ancient Greek philosophy, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle. Christianity from the beginning opted for this side. And it is in support of the communion of persons. The primacy of will is represented by Islam, Western voluntarism, Occam, modern natural science in its initial impetus. Of course, there's much true knowledge in natural science, so reason is at work there. The schools, the universities, the media, in support of rights or demands of the individual. I think that's one of the main, perhaps the main outcome, this reconfiguring of the cultural debate. Moving further down, the bottom groups appear. Apostles on the right, prophets on the left. Now, the conclusion of the Regensburg Lecture, which surprised many people. The fountain of living water coming from the throne of the Lamb. So, a reference to the book of Revelation. And so I come to my conclusion. This attempt at a self-critique of modern reason, that's a description of the whole thrust of the Regensburg Lecture, a self-critique of modern reason, has nothing to do with putting the clock back to the time before the Enlightenment and rejecting the insights of the modern age. In the Western world, the largely dominant opinion is that only positivistic reason and the forms of philosophy based on it are universally valid. It's the self-limitation of reason. And then a remarkable statement, I think, courage for the breadth of reason, not denial of its greatness. This is the program with which a theology grounded in biblical faith enters into the debate of our times. So this finishes the section on the Regensburg Lecture, and I enter now into this remarkable essay, The Origin and Essence of the Church, which begins with an account of how to approach scripture. Before we go there, this is the center of the painting. You can see three items lined up. There's the Holy Spirit, the lamb in the middle, and the fountain of living water at the bottom. There, the fountain 
is bubbling out, and you can see how it transforms the pebbles into jewels on, on the sides. Here, the picture of the lamb, which seems to be taken from the book of Revelation. There's a very strange verse in the book of Revelation. I saw in the middle of the throne a lamb standing as slain. Many translations soften it by saying it stands as if it had been slain. But the plain Greek is, it stands as slain. When a butcher slays a lamb, it doesn't stand, it lies down. But this, stand, this lamb stands precisely as slain. It comes out in a few verses later in the same passage. Worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals, because you were slain and have ransomed people for God by your blood from every tribe and language and people and nation. And then, well known to all who know Handel's Messiah, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. So it's the apparent weakness in which strength is found. There, the blood of the Lamb pours into the Eucharistic chalice. And a closer up. Ratzinger's essay on the origin and essence of the church begins with a sketch of the main developments in 20th century biblical studies. It shows that biblical scholars tended to impose the dominant ideologies of their times on scripture. And that's an attempt to, as we're, lift them off. I should point to two really classical recommended studies, Scott Hahn's Covenant and Communion, the biblical theology of Pope Benedict XVI, and especially the second one, Scott Hahn and Benjamin Weicker politicizing the Bible, which does exactly in more detail what Ratzinger does in this essay. The roots of historical criticism and the secularization of scripture, 1300 to 1700. The face of the lamb seems a personal face. It's a look of great strength. Lambs usually have their eyes on the sides and not in front, but this lamb has its eyes in front. So we'll begin with that to move down, expand downward from the lamb in the section on the approach to scripture. In the sketch of the imposing of certain ideologies on scripture, Ratzinger distinguishes three generations in the 20th century. We can distinguish three generations of exegetes and corresponding to these three great phases in the history of biblical interpretation in our century. This is an overview for orientation. Before World War I, what was dominant was the liberal image of Jesus as a preacher of morality and the freedom of conscience, uninterested in founding a church as an institution. After World War I, there was a collapse of confidence in liberal institutions. The desire for communion in the sacred arose. And the characteristic thesis was formulated the church is born from the Eucharist. This thesis, Ratzinger says, as far as he can see, was first worked out fully by Ferdinand Kattenbusch, who was professor of Protestant theology in Göttingen, the successor of Ritschl, 
So this is an example of ecumenical theology in action. Of course, there were negative phenomena as well in this period. Uh, certain political authoritarianism, but the Edmund Waldstein pointed to that in his talk yesterday. Ratzinger doesn't talk much about that, but he takes that, he, he agrees with that thesis. After World War II, the shared theme in biblical studies was Jesus came to announce the eschaton, simply the Greek word for the last thing, the end of the world. And exegetes tended to return under this shared theme to liberalism in various forms. For example, the challenge of the moment as eschaton in Bultmann's individualist existentialism, I'll talk in more detail in a minute, and the classless society as eschaton in Marxist utopia. And I won't talk in detail about that because that's been, in a way, superseded. Regarding the first phase, the moralism of the first phase, Ratzinger says, such a Jesus who rejects cultic worship, changes religion into morality, and then defines it as the business of the individual, obviously cannot found a church. He is the enemy of all institutions, and therefore doesn't establish one himself. The First World War brought the collapse of the liberal world, and thus also a turn away from its individualism and moralism. The great political bodies, which had relied entirely on science and technology as carriers of the progress of humanity, had failed as forces of ethical order. In this way, the yearning for communion in the sacred was reawakened. The church was rediscovered particularly also in the Protestant area. Eric Peterson is an example, who then later became a Catholic, a great opponent of Adolf von Harnack. Ecce agnus dei qui tollit peccato mundi, written on the, on the altar there. Jesus' Last Supper came to be recognized in its significance as the source of communion. And the thesis was formulated, Jesus founded a new community by means of the Last Supper itself. The Last Supper is the origin of the church and her enduring norm. Hence, the lamb on the altar, symbol of the Eucharist that takes place in front of it, is absolutely appropriate to that, that thesis. This thesis was, as far as I know, he says, first worked out by Kattenbusch. The irony of this is Kattenbusch's essay was a contribution to a volume celebrating Adolf von Harnack. And Harnack saw the church as Kantas, as a voluntary association of morally like-minded people. And Kattenbusch, reading the essay as one can see it's, um, he's aware of the tension with Harnack. In the neoliberal world, we're now in the third phase, a variant of the former liberal theology now became active in new forms. The eschatological interpretation of Jesus' message, as Jesus proclaimed the eschaton, the end of the world, Although Jesus is no longer conceived as a pure moralist, he is once again construed in opposition to the cult and the historical institutions of the Old Testament. Jesus proclaims the end of institutions. His eschatological message may have been conceived according to the mentality of his time as an announcement of the end of the world, but it's retrieved for our day as the breakthrough from the institutional into the charismatic. Once again, there can be no question 
of establishing a church. Such as the one portrayed here around the Eucharist, assembled around the Eucharist. The most influential version of this approach was developed by Rudolf Bultmann. I think to grasp his approach, one needs to go back to Kant for at least a minute. Kant accepts the modern image of the material universe as a self-enclosed mechanism completely explained by mathematical laws without any need or room for God as first cause. Yet he rejects the utilitarian ethics that arose together with this image of the universe from the ambition of power over nature. Utilitarianism, he argues, destroys the dignity of persons by treating them as mere things, as means for progress. Kant's method is to develop a new theory of knowledge that sharply limits theoretical reason and separates practical reason completely, strictly from theoretical reason. Impossible in this setup, but it's real, and the ethics that flows from it are immediately together. Kant says, I had to do away with knowledge to make room for faith. First, in the case of theoretical reason. Theoretical reason is limited to scientifically exploring the self-enclosed mathematical universe. This universe, in Kant, does not exist in itself. It's a product of the human mind, which imposes its own patterns, stencils, you could almost say, such as space and time on received sense data. And that's the first aspect of doing away with knowledge. Theoretical reason, according to that construction, is completely incompetent to say anything outside the limits of the material universe. He can neither deny nor affirm the existence of God. More and more of the group of Old Testament and New Testament come into view. Practical reason doesn't depend on or imply any theoretical knowledge, but has a completely separate foundation, namely the moral autonomy of the person. And that's the second aspect of doing away with knowledge. God is a morally decent thought without any content of theoretical truth or falsehood. It's neither true nor false. And since faith doesn't affirm or deny any theoretical truth, there can be no conflict between faith and science. It's a way of making peace between the conflicting elements of, of early modernity. Bultmann, in turn, is convinced also that the image of the self-contained mechanical universe that leaves no room for a creator is inevitable for anyone living in the modern age. Everyone relies on science and technology. One way he puts it is, if you flick an electric switch, you can't believe in miracles. It's a, it's a very rigid affirmation of the inevitable power of this image of the world. To find a place for Christian faith, nevertheless, he adopts the framework of Kant's theory of knowledge, but replaces Kant's moralistic understanding of faith with an existentialist understanding. This is now a dense formulation, I know, but it's an attempt to render it in brief, faith is the form, 
human choice takes on in the challenge of the moment. At every moment I'm faced with the challenge of what shall I do? When the proclaimed word of God, the kerygma, makes its impact on that choice. For God is nothing other than the linguistic event of the kerygma. One way in which he put it, first it was proposed as a caricature of his view, but he assented to it. Jesus rose into the kerygma. Sola Scriptura is there taken to its most radical extreme. Even God is Sola Scriptura. As in Kant, also in Bultmann, faith has no theoretical content. It, can neither, it neither affirms nor denies the existence of God. And it's therefore compatible with the scientific image of the closed universe. So even a person living in the modern age can be a Christian. Coming now to the lower limit of the picture. In a careful analysis, this is quoting from Ratzinger, Michael Waldstein, whom, whom I know, <laughs> whom I know. Though I, I don't usually see his face, but uh, has shown that Bultmann's theory of knowledge was thoroughly shaped by Marburg neo-Kantian philosophy. There's a reference to the essay in which I developed that. The foundation in Kant's theory of knowledge is tacitly present at every moment as the self-evident hermeneutical point of departure that guides the way of historical criticism. So Bultmann portrays himself as a scientist, a historical scientist, but it's these philosophical foundations that really shape what goes on. The question then is, the outcome of Ratzinger's sketch is to call such forms of biblical scholarship into question. What then is the alternative? What's the positive thing left? That's the big question. From here on, I will focus on groups of people around the Lamb, and you can distinguish seven groups. There's a group of male saints in the top left, of women saints in the top right, a group of angels closest. In the bottom, there seem to be four groups, although they're Two of them are, they come in pairs, but some of them are standing, some of them are kneeling, that's the difference. The kneeling ones on the left seem to be prophets. The, the ones behind it, at least according to some people, are representatives of the chosen people, patriarchs and so on. On the right, the apostles, and then bishops, popes, priests in liturgical garbs. So what is the outcome of this? The group of angels immediately around the Lamb, worshipping. We gain new confidence in the eternal continuity of the church's memory. If you look at this carousel of changing interpretations of scripture according to distinct ideologies, and you come to doubt whether that makes sense, then you gain confidence in something more permanent. In both her sacramental life and in her proclamation of the word, the church constitutes a distinctive subject whose memory preserves the seemingly past word and action of Jesus as a present reality the two angels with the thurbles. You can't see the smoke, but uh, it's supposed to be imagined to be there. But there's a question that arises about Ratzinger's formulation. How can memory preserve the past word and action of Jesus as a present reality? 
While the act of remembering may take place in the present, doesn't what it recalls remain past? One of the most beautiful angels, the, the fascination in the angel's eyes are, is, is palpable. This phrase, the church's memory, one of the first things it recalls to me is, do this in remembrance of me. The words of institution of the, of the Eucharist. Do this implies a present doing. So Jesus' past deed of giving his body. His body is given in the present. Father Luis Granado showed yesterday in his talk many, many other modes of anamnesis. Lives of the saints are, he didn't talk about that, but the census fidelium, the apostolic magisterium, etc. But what I want to do is look, take a closer look at the present that is there in scripture. You think not only about the past in reading scripture, but there's a present address. Now the group of male saints, some of them popes, uh, many of them martyrs on the, with um, palms as the sign of their martyrdom. One, one of my great experiences was being invited by Pope Benedict to be a per itus or as helper at the 2008 Synod of Bishops on Scripture. And the opening discourse of Pope Benedict made a profound expression on me. It was, it was really remarkable. Here are some central passages. It is a great danger in our reading of scripture that we stop at the human words. Words from the past, past history. And do not discover the present in the past. The Holy Spirit who speaks to us today in the words of the past. In this way, we do not enter into the interior movement of the word which in human words conceals and reveals divine words. Therefore, there's always a need for seeking. We must always look for the word within the words. The group from up close of male saints. With his incarnation, he said, I'm yours. And in baptism, he said to me, I'm yours. In the Holy Eucharist, he says ever anew, so that's present, I'm yours. So that we may respond, Lord, I'm yours. In the Renaissance, the marriage vows were, I'm yours, you're mine. In the way of the word, entering the mystery of his incarnation, of his being among us, we want to appropriate his being. We want to expropriate our existence, giving ourselves to him who gave himself, and one could say gives himself also to us. The flowers next to the male group Altogether, more than 40 species of flowers have been identified in this painting, very faithfully uh, copied. I'm yours. Let us pray the Lord that we may learn to say this word with our whole being. Thus, we will be in the heart of the word. Thus, we will be saved. And here's the link. It'll be available to you once these talks are generally available. Close up. The faces, the remarkable characterization of distinct faces who become part of this one people. 
Now, the origin of the church, this was so far approach to scripture. Now, the specific origin of the church. Opposite, a group of women saints, also many of them martyrs. Again, marvelous flowers right next to them. The institution of the Eucharist on the evening before the Passion establishes a covenant. And inasmuch as it establishes a covenant, it is the concrete foundation of a new people, profoundly different from Harnack's idea of a voluntary association of morally like-minded people, where the initiative goes from, ah, these people think like me, let me, let me join them. New people, which becomes a people through its covenant relation with God. We could also say that the event of the Eucharist, or by the event of the Eucharist, Jesus draws the disciples into his relationship with God, and therefore into his mission, which aims to reach the many, the human race in all places and in all times. The flowers next to the women, they're much more splendid than the flowers next to the men. Rightly, rightly so, remarkable. Um, richness and detail. These disciples become a people through communion with the body and blood of Jesus, which is at the same time communion with God. The Old Testament theme of covenant, which Jesus incorporates into his preaching, receives a new center. Communion with Christ's body. And the women martyrs in this image, um, that's a very bodily way of sharing in that union. The people of the new covenant comes to be a people from the body and blood of Christ. Only from this center is it a people. We've heard this thesis in various ways in many of the talks that were, that were given. We can call it people of God only because through communion with Christ, the relationship with God opens up in a way in which man cannot produce it of himself. The women from up close. Now, the essence of the church that flows from this origin, the lower group, Old Testament, patriarchs, other Jews of the chosen people. There's debate about exactly who they are. So this is one hypothesis, but I think a very plausible one. The essence of the church in three main points the church is people, body, and bride. People first. The Greek word ecclesia that lives on in the Latin loan word ecclesia rests on the Old Testament root kahal. Ordinary translated, assembly of the people. Such assemblies of the people in which the people constituted itself. So it's a public event. It's not a private association. Constituted itself as a cultic entity. It was very clear in antiquity. And deriving from the cult as a juridical and political entity. Existed both in the Greek and the Semitic world. One author thinks it's the Jews in the diaspora in the back. You can see the multiplicity of hat styles that are quite different for different. This typically biblical conception of assembly of the people 
is traceable to the assembly on Sinai as the normative image of all further assemblies of the people. But because the dispersion of Israel continued and slavery returned, a kahal, coming from God himself, a new gathering and establishment of the people, increasingly became the core of Israel's hope. The petition for this gathering, for the appearing of the ecclesia, the definitive ecclesia, is a fixed component of prayer in Second Temple Judaism. The kneeling group. Some people think it's the minor prophets and behind them the major prophets, but it's, it's not so clear. It is thus clear what it means when the nascent church calls itself ecclesia. It thereby says, in us, this petition has been granted. Christ who died and is risen is the living Sinai. Those who approach him are the chosen final gathering of God's people. The apostles, barefoot, the ecclesiastics, beautifully dressed in nice shoes. So that was Ecclesia, now body of Christ. Eucharistic communion builds the church by opening the walls of subjectivity and gathering us into a deep communion of existence. It is the event of gathering in which the Lord brings us together. The apostles from up close, all with heavy beards, somewhat of a wild bunch. The formula, the church is the body of Christ, thus states that the Eucharist in which the Lord gives us his body and makes us one body is the enduring place where the church comes to be, where he always establishes it anew. The apostles, John traditionally represented without a beard as young and beautiful. And finally, bride. In the sacrament, as an act of love, two subjects are fused, God and his people, who overcome their separation and become one. Hence, the Eucharistic mystery precisely in assimilating the spousal image, remains the core of the concept of the church. And its description by the term body of Christ. But an important new aspect comes, becomes visible. The church is the body, not by an identity without distinction, but by the pneumatic, the spiritual, real act of spousal love. In their indissoluble spiritual bodily union, spouses remain unmixed and unconfused. This is the final image. We're now going to the section on John, briefly. Um, and I won't have images of the same painting anymore there. Part two, and the Gospel of John. My purpose here is to sketch that in studying the Gospel of John, the insights of Pope Benedict are very fruitful. It's been my experience that that's the case. Studying the Gospel of John has been my love since the last year of high school, and it's been the main interest since then. John's purpose is writing signs. That's clear in the statement in 20, 30 to 31. Jesus did many other signs not written in this book. These signs are written 
that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. You can see three levels of purpose here. The ultimate purpose is that you may have life in his name. The intermediate, that you may believe. But the immediate purpose of the Gospel of John is the writing of signs. So the big question is, well, what are these signs? The first text in which John mentions sign is the conclusion of the Cana narrative. This Jesus did as the beginning of signs in Cana of Galilee and revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. So John adds a step if you compare the statement of purpose with this text. Between sign and believing, the sign reveals glory. Glory, in turn, is the motive for believing. There we are in, at the very beginning, the demand that in reading scripture, in looking at Jesus, the aesthetic dimension is of crucial importance. Glory translates Hebrew kabod, which means weight, importance, bright radiance, honor. It's a broad range of meanings. The Septuagint strangely consistently uses doxa in Plato. It's opinion as opposed to knowledge. But the point of intersection is honor. But doxa then took on this aspect of bright radiance and of beauty. Glory refers to the power of a being to make itself known and recognized. Glory is the superlative beauty, intrinsically persuasive by attraction without violence. And of course, Hans Urs von Balthasar's theological aesthetics is, unfolds this, these ideas in marvelous detail. Cana and Golgotha, since Sign is defined for the first time so clearly in Cana at the end. It's interesting to take a look at it. On the third day, there was a wedding. The mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and the disciples had also been invited. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And then comes the mysterious answer. Jesus said to her, woman, what is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. The hour in the Gospel of John always refers to the passion of Jesus. So he seems to be understanding it in some way as an invitation to the beginning of, of the passion. His mother said to his servants, do whatever he tells you. Then the, the six water jars, you know, about fill them to the rim. They're brought to the steward and the steward says to the bridegroom the bridegroom says nothing does nothing in that scene you have kept the good wine until now and then comes a concluding verse which we already looked at this jesus did as the beginning of signs in cana of galilee and revealed his glory the steward's words to the bridegroom about the good wine actually apply to Jesus. And a little later in John 3, 29, John the Baptist calls Jesus the bridegroom. Commentators point out a similarity in the way the Canaan narrative is structured and the narrative of the covenant on Mount Sinai. And according to rabbinic teaching, the wedding between God and his people took place on Mount Sinai. So. The wedding of Cana seems to be a symbolic representation of the new covenant. But even more striking are the parallels between Cana and Golgotha. They are really quite amazing. Step by step, these two narratives parallel each other. First, the persons, the place and the persons present. While the mother of, while the soldiers did this, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas. Then, introduction to Jesus' words. When Jesus saw the mother, it's usually translated his mother, but it says the mother. It's a kind of universalizing of 
And the disciple whom he loved, standing beside her, he said to the mother, woman, Gunai, look your son. Then he said to the disciple, look your mother. A professor of John at the Biblicum, Ignace de la Poterie, did research on this. There aren't other examples of sons calling their mothers Gunai, the vocative of Gunai woman. Um, it's an unusual way of addressing your mother. Adam called Eve, according to the Septuagint, <coughs> Gunai. Maybe an echo of that. My hour has not yet come in Cana. From that hour, the disciple took her into his own. The mother telling him, do whatever he tells you. Something somewhat parallel after this, when he knew that all had already been finished, so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst. Then the water jars, very similar formulations. But there's sour wine. It's a third wine added to the other two. So they put a sponge full of sour wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. And when he had taken the wine, he said, it is fulfilled. Then he bowed his head and gave over the spirit. Then comes recourse to the authorities. And after that, but when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they didn't break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear. And at once there came out blood and water, which seems to correlate with the good wine at Cana. And the conclusion, which is very similar to the conclusion of the Cana narrative, not in terms of glory, but in terms of truth. And the one who saw has testified. And his testimony is true. And he knows that he, that he says what is true, so that you also may believe. For these things took place, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. A reference to the paschal lamb, the meat of which was to be eaten. And again, another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. So John seems to have written Cana and Golgotha consciously as a pair. One should follow his lead and read them in light of each other. While Cana is the first sign, Golgotha is the last and true sign. It's the moment in which, as the prologue says, the light shines into the darkness and the darkness did not overcome it. Cana is an event of joy in a wedding. Golgotha, an event of suffering and death. They're opposites. Yet, if Cana throws light on Golgotha, the cross appears as the true messianic wedding with objective joy beneath all suffering. And since Golgotha throws light on Cana, the shadow of the hour already appears in Jesus' words to his mother. They don't have wine. My hour has not yet come. Jesus himself points to the definitive sign. So there's a confirmation independent of that parallel between Cain and Golgotha, that the real sign is the cross, not apart from the resurrection. What sign do you show us that you can do these things is what he's asked after the cleansing of the temple. Destroy this temple and in three days I will build it up. He was speaking about the temple of his body. So the death of Jesus is the definitive sign, but only when seen in the light of the resurrection. Ratzinger in one essay, the center of the gospel consists in the message of the resurrection and thus in the message that of God acting that comes before all human acting. In the Bread of Life discourse, Jesus again points to the definitive sign, but this time in a Eucharistic key. Right after the multiplication of loaves, which is a fantastic sign, they ask him, what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What do you work? 
Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, as is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, Amen, amen, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. So he himself is the true bread from heaven, the fulfillment of the sign of manna. And a little later in the same discourse, he speaks of it as his flesh and blood. I think in light of this, one can understand one of the main structuring elements of John. Here are various structuring elements. I won't go into all of them, but look on the right hand, there's the lineup of the signs, seven of them. The first is wine, then come two healings. The fourth is bread, then comes a healing, then comes a raising, and then comes the blood and the lamb. On, and already from the parallel between one and seven, one knows that seven is the fulfillment with the explicit Eucharistic discourse right in the middle between them. I think that's a strong indication that there is a fundamentally Eucharistic structure to these, to these signs. Now, the very last point absence of the institution of the Eucharist from the Last Supper is a puzzling thing. But one needs to raise the question, does it disappoint the reader's expectation or does it fulfill it in a different way? Hansus von Balthasar's suggestion is that the whole farewell discourses, including the washing of the feet, is an unfolding in words of the content of the Eucharist. One would have to go step by step through, but I'll limit myself to one point. When he mentions the effects of the Eucharist, Jesus says in John 6, the one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me and I live through the Father, so also that one, namely the one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood, will live through me. There's a passage in John 17 that seems to unfold at exactly this point. If you put it together with John 13, you have three panels that are quite similar to each other, very similar in grammatical structure. In the middle, you have two that clauses, sandwiching an as clause, and then a third that clause, but they differ. The first, asks the Father for a future desired result. I do not ask you for them alone, the disciples, but for those, those who believe in me through their word, that all may be one, but it's not a horizontal unity. As you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they too may be in us. That's the mode of unity between the disciples. But then comes a decisive step that the world may believe that you sent me. So the union of Christians with that depth dimension of rootedness in God has to be in some way visible as a persuasive sign of evangelization that comes out more clearly in the next panel, which is not about a future desired result, but a past and present reality. And the theme of glory reappears. So Ratzinger's preoccupation with the aesthetic dimension. The glory you have given me, I have given to them. Remarkable statement. I wonder how often you've thought about having received the glory of Christ yourself. That they may be one. So that's the effect of the gift. As we are one. I in them and you in me, a slight variation on in me. So there was mutual, here it's a descending line, that they may be completed into one, that the world may know that you sent me and that you loved them as you loved me. Very parallel to the new commandment. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another 
as I have loved you, that you too may love one another. And the same sign function with its evangelizing aspect, in this all will know that you are my disciples. Instead of a conclusion, I want to play a piece of music. So if you click once more, then it's by Claudio Monteverdi, a piece composed for the elevation of the Eucharist during Mass, in a little bit louder. Thanks very much for listening. I'd like to now call on uh, Dr. Bill Wright to make the response. Uh, Dr. Bill Wright is a biblical scholar and professor in the Department of Catholic Studies at Duquesne University. He received his PhD in New Testament studies from Emory University. He is the author of several books, including The Bible and Catholic Resourcement, Essays in Scripture and Theology, and with Father Francis Martin, The Gospel of John and Encountering the Living God in Scripture, Theological and Philosophical Principles for Interpretation. He has been elected to the Studiorum Novi Testamenti Societas and also serves on the U.S. Lutheran Roman Catholic Ecumenical Dialogue. Please welcome Dr. Bill Wright. (laughs) 
Dr. Waldstein has provided us with a rich presentation that covers much ground and elegantly integrates a panoply of related topics. These include, for instance, the relationship between truth and beauty, both of which are grounded in the divine logos, rival accounts of human rationality and freedom, biblical hermeneutics, ecclesial anamnesis, Eucharistic ecclesiology, nuptial mysticism, and a synthetic interpretation of episodes from the Gospel of John, all interspersed with magnificent images of the adoration of the mystic lamb on the Ghent altarpiece. There is indeed much to reflect on and engage with here. As a structural guide for much of the presentation, Waldstein employs Joseph Ratzinger's essay, The Origin and Essence of the Church. He highlights in particular the following words, wherein Ratzinger speaks of the church as a remembering subject, quote, in both her sacramental life and in her proclamation of the word, the church constitutes a distinctive subject whose memory seeming preserves the seemingly past word and action of Jesus as a present reality. Following up on this quote, Waldstein then asks, quote, how can memory preserve the past word and recognition, or excuse me, past word and action of Jesus as a present reality? Acknowledging that there are many avenues by which this theological reality can be explored, Waldstein focuses on scripture and the Eucharist as two different ways in the which the church encounters God in the present moment through the ecclesial remembering of something past. Ratzinger's identification in this essay of the church as a remembering subject coheres with his theological claim that the church's remembering of Jesus is a constitutive element of her identity as the church. For instance, in Principles of Catholic Theology, Ratzinger writes, quote, <clears throat> the Christian faith by its very nature includes the act of remembering. The seat of faith is then the memoria ecclesiae, the memory of the church, the church as memory, end quote. The revelation given in Jesus Christ, that is the word of God, is that which the church remembers and gives unified expression to in her faith. Now, later in this discussion in principles, Ratzinger makes what I take to be a rather stark point. <clears throat> he writes, quote, the decisive question for today is whether that memory can continue to exist through which the church becomes church and without which she sinks into nothingness, end quote. The remembering of the revelation in Christ, which constitutes ecclesial faith, is in part what makes the church to be the church. And Ratzinger seems to suggest here that without this memory, and I might add the related action of remembering, so not only what the church remembers, but the church's action of remembering it, that without this, the church would wither away or mutate into something else. The existence of these possibilities, coupled with the vital importance of memory for the church's life, suggests that on Ratzinger's account, ecclesial remembering is a practice which the church can do or fail to do, and which can be done well or done poorly. As regard the church's memory, Ratzinger writes, quote, there can be a waxing or a waning, a forgetting or a remembering, but no recasting of truth in time, end quote. And indeed, one might set these intra-ecclesial possibilities alongside Cyril O'Regan's recent mapping of the Enlightenment's forgetting of the Christian tradition by setting new canons of rationality and plausibility, or is what uh, Dr. Waldstein uh, referenced with regard to the Regensburg lecture, these self-limitations of modern scientific rationality. So the Enlightenment forgets Christianity for on O'Regan's account, and Hegel's misremembering O'Regan's term of the Christian tradition by so reconfiguring it that a counterfeit version of Christianity results. And so remembering the revelation in Christ well or remembering it poorly, forgetting it 
or misremembering it. These are all possibilities which lay before the Christians in every age. Now, on several occasions, Ratzinger appeals to the Gospel of John as a resource for continued theological thinking about the church's remembering. And this is quite important. For throughout its narrative, the fourth gospel says that after Jesus' resurrection, the disciples remember something about him, his words and deeds, and the scriptures in relation to him. That's in John 2, 17, 2, 22, and 12, 16. This remembering is not simple recollection, for it involves the disciples coming to a new and more profound understanding of Jesus, an understanding which they did not have at first. The gospel points to the disciples' post-resurrectional remembering and new understanding of Jesus as the work of the Holy Spirit in the disciples. For in the farewell discourse, Jesus tells the disciples that when the Holy Spirit comes after the resurrection, he will, quote, remind you, 1426, and then later in 1613, quote, lead you into all truth. So that is, the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth, because he guides them to a deeper understanding of Jesus, who is himself the truth, 14.6. Now, a related and, to my mind, underexplored scriptural presentation of ecclesial remembering is given in the first letter of John. Indeed, first John amplifies this basic picture by showing ecclesial remembrance to be a Christian practice, which not only needs to be done well, but also has bearing on the church's nature as communion. So in these remarks, I wish to compliment Dr. Waldstein's presentation about ecclesial remembering and Eucharist in the Gospel of John by focusing on ecclesial remembering as a Christian practice in the first letter of John. And so my presentation here has three principal parts. Part one, what was heard from the beginning. To begin with, the Joannine epistles employ a different lexicon for speaking about ecclesial membering than does the Gospel of John, whereas the Gospel uses a form of the verb, the Greek verb mimneskamai, to talk about the disciples' membering. <clears throat> First John, as well as Second John, speaks instead of what was heard, using the verb akuo in the aorist or perfect tense, and from the beginning. So what was heard and from the beginning. In 1 John, this combination of expressions is applied to both the author of the epistle, who I'm just going to call John, and the audience in different though related ways. We will discuss each in turn. So the proing to the Gospel of John, verses 1 to 4, provides the basic template for the content, process, and goals of John's teaching in this letter. There are three major points to make in this regard. First, the proeme interlaces a series of verbs in both the past and present tense. We'll talk about the past tense ones first. The author speaks, for example, of what we have heard, what we have seen. Those are both perfect tense verbs. And then looked upon and touched. The verbs that are used more than once in this sequence, the verbs have heard, akekoamen, and have seen, Heorakamen are in the perfect tense, which connotes a past action with an ongoing effect. So that which John has heard and seen in the past has ongoing influence into the present. Moreover, these past tense verbs, as you can see, are all verbs of physical sensation, hear, see, touch. The author supplements this point by also mentioning bodily sense organs, what we saw with our eyes, what our hands touched in 1-1. Now, the, uh, the object of the author's manifold sense experience is the divine life, which was, quote, made manifest, twice mentioned in verse 2, in the humanity of Jesus. Uh, even at the very end of the letter in 520, John calls Jesus eternal life. The repeated use of sensory verbs and mentions of sense organs in the proem all serve to underscore the physical realism of Christ's humanity, wherein the invisible and divine becomes perceptible and tangible to human beings. 
So along with De La Poterie, we can say that when the author who speaks of what he has heard and seen from the beginning, he speaks of the public manifestation of the divine in the humanity of Jesus, which he himself saw and heard. Point two, the revelation of God in the humanity of Jesus, which took place in the past, in which John took in through his experiences, provide the substance for what he now proclaims to audiences in the present time. Now, the proem juxtaposes to these verbs of sensation in the past tense, several verbs of proclamation and testimony in the present tense. So that which John encountered in the humanity of Jesus in the past is what he now testifies to. So these are in um, italics. Uh, what he testifies to or bears witness to and announces to his audience in the presence. And then in verse 4, writes. I, uh, we are writing these things. Okay. More... Um, Moreover, John's, it is John's encounter with the divine revelation in Jesus, an encounter that not only involves his historical sense experiences, but also the correlate uh, and related action of the Holy Spirit in him that undergirds, undergirds his authority to teach as he does. So you'll notice that he frames this um, using the first person plural we. Um, I have the opinion following Richard Baucom here that when John says we, He's using it in an authoritative sense. So it's, he uses we, but he means I, and he uses we to um, establish his, his singular authority. Point three about the proem. The proem specifies that the goal of John's proclamation, proclaiming the revelation in Christ is communion, koinonia. He writes in 1.3, quote, what we have seen and have heard, we are also announcing to you so that, in a result clause, you may have communion with us, end quote. John wants his audience to live in communion with him and by extension with God. And our communion is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ, 1-3. The upshot for our purposes is that the faithful reception of the apostolic proclamation of the revelation in Christ correlates with people's spiritual communion with God in the church. Now, after the proem, there are no other cases in 1 John where the author speaks specifically of what he has, quote, heard from the beginning, though he will identify some of its contents of this memory. All other uses of this language in the letter proclaim, pertain pardon me, to John's ecclesial audience. Now, there are five instances in 1 John and one instance in 2 John where the author mentions what his audience has, quote, heard from the beginning. In one case, this phrase refers generally to the revelation in Christ proclaimed, which the audience took in by faith when they became Christians. That's in 2.24. The other four instances uses, the other four uses of this language as to the audience specify some of the content of the revealed word proclaimed. Two of them are about the love command, and the other two, interestingly, speak of the eschatological coming of Antichrist. Now, as De La Poterie has argued, the two manners in which one John speaks of what he has heard from the beginning, what the author has heard from the beginning, what the audience has heard from the beginning, go together. What was revealed in Christ in which John himself has heard, the author's from the beginning, is the exactly what he proclaims and which his audience has received in faith. Thus, what they have received from the beginning. So, when applied to the audience, this expression, what we heard from the beginning, refers to the beginning of their Christian life, when they took in the revealed word of God proclaimed to them by John in faith. So, when John speaks to his audience of what they've heard from beginning, he's directing them to remember the divine revelation in Jesus, which comes to them through John's testimony. So having established that the object of ecclesial remembering in John is the revelation in Jesus proclaimed by John and received by faith in believers, I now wish to turn to the second component, the way in which John presents ecclesial remembering as a Christian practice. 
When John speaks to his audience of, quote, what you've heard from the beginning, 224, he's asking them to engage in the work of remembering. He's not teaching them something new, though he might be bringing past revealed content to bear on a present situation in a new way. Rather, John's reminding his audience of something which they already know, and he's directing his audience to remember these things for the sake of certain desired outcomes. Now, our understanding of these appeals can be enhanced by recognizing their character within the world of Hellenistic moral discourse. Appeals to memory and to what one already knows are common elements in Hellenistic paranesis, a popular form of Greco-Roman moral exhortation, whereas one is encouraged by an authority figure to engage in certain actions and or refrain from others. For instance, in an epistle on giving moral advice, the Roman philosopher Seneca discusses the role in Paranesis of appealing to what the audience already knows. He writes, quote, we sometimes know facts without paying attention to them, end quote. And then later, the appeal to what is already known, Seneca writes, quote, engages the intention, rouses us, and concentrates the memory, keeping it from losing grip. Seneca then cites a series of moral examples wherein what is already known to be good is pointed out for the sake of corresponding imitation and practice. The purpose of these appeals to memory and to what is already known, Seneca writes, is moral action in the present. Quote, you must continually bring, uh, be brought to remember these facts, for they should not be in storage, but be ready for use, end quote. Pliny the Younger, these are both examples that are relatively contemporary with the Joannine epistles. Pliny the Younger also makes such appeals in a letter to a certain Maximus who's about to assume the Roman governorship of Achaia, or Greece. He opens the letter, quote, I know you need no telling, but my love for you prompts me to remind you to keep in mind and put into practice what you know already, end quote. He proceeds to give Maximus a variety of instructions on how to govern and conduct himself as the proconsul of Achaia. And he often frames these instructions with the imperatives, quote, remember, and, quote, never, never forget. Literally, again, it's a variation on remember. The Latin is meminisse. Pliny closes the lender by it, admitting that these reminders are really moral instructions for Maximus to put into practice. Quote, this letter was intended not to tell, but to remind you of your duties, though I know I'm really, really telling you as well, end quote. So, like, I'm not writing to tell you anything new, but I really am. Okay. So, seen in this light, John's frequent appeals to what the audience heard from the beginning are very much at home in the world of Hellenistic moral exhortation. The author, in a sense, speaks as a Hellenistic teacher, an authority, who instructs his audience to engage in a particular activity, namely remembering, for the sake of certain desired ends. Specifically, John directs his audience to remember the divine revelation in Christ, which they received through, his, through John's own testimony at the beginning of their Christian life. Received as it was at the beginning of their Christian life, the received word of divine revelation is at the very foundation and reason for the church's existence as the church. Thus, the act of ecclesial remembering is a practice which is ingredient to the very identity of the church. So thus, the previously recited claims of Ratzinger, like, quote, the Christian faith by its very nature includes the act of remembering, end quote, are very much in keeping with the teaching of First John. Now, as evidenced in Seneca and Pliny, such paranetic appeals to memory and to what is already known are ordered to the adoption of certain practices or avoidance of others. Thus, in 1 John, the rem remembering the received revelation of God in Christ is something which the audience, that is the church, needs to do in part because of the purposes which this ecclesial memory serves. So in my final expository section, I will focus on how the practice of ecclesial remembering relates to the church's communion, koinonia, with the Father and the Son. So part three, uh, ecclesial remembering and communion.
In 1 John 2.24, the author instructs his ecclesial audience to remember what they, quote, heard from the beginning, and he speaks of this content in quasi-substantive terms as something within them. And he connects this content in causal and conditional ways to the church's union with God. So he writes, quote, let what you heard from the beginning remain in you. If what you heard from the beginning remains in you, you will remain in the Father and in the Son. End quote. That's 1 John 2.24. Now this verse recalls John's earlier statement in the proem, uh, verse 3. What we have seen and have heard, we are also announcing to you so that you may have communion with us, and our communion is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So having the revealed word remain in believers correlates with their being in communion with the Father and the Son. Now, while a full substantiation of this point exceeds the scope of this presentation, it seems that part of the reason why the revealed word of God, that is received by believers in faith, what they have heard from the beginning, correlates with their koinonia, their communion with God, is because the word of God is a real mode of God's presence in believers. In the fourth gospel, Jesus speaks of his word as a reality which becomes actively present in his believers. 15.3, you are cleansed because of the word I have taught you and which creates interpersonal communion with him and his disciples. Thus, um, John 15, 7, Jesus says, quote, if you remain in me and my words remain in you. So as others, De La Potomiri, Bob Lamard, and others have argued, first John uses a constellation of expressions for this inner reality. It is the word of God, 214, the anointing, uh, 2, 20 and 27, the seed of God, uh, 3, 9. And in 2 John, it's called the truth, verse 2, and the teaching, verse 9, in 2 John. Now, importantly, in 1 John, the author says of all these different terms, the word, the anointing, the seed, and what you've heard from beginning, they're all associated with the verb remain in believers. All of these things remain in or dwell in or present in believers. So what the ecclesial audience has heard from the beginning is the word of God himself. And the word of God, the logos, comes to indwell believers when they take in the apostolic proclamation by faith. So Dr. Valchen had mentioned Bultmann, and there's a point to what he says when he says that the kerygma is an encounter with the word, but unlike Bultmann, John's teaching on the kerygma has content to it. It has uh, presence to it. It has, you know, you know, substance. In a classic 1949 article, Marie-Emile Bromard argued that 1 John also uses a variety of verbal expressions to name this same reality of divine presence in believers, such as to be in communion, to remain in God and God remain in uh, people, to be born of God and to know God. This invisible, indwelling divine presence is what empowers and so becomes manifest in certain actions of believers, in particular, the profession of apostolic faith and their love for one another. Through faith, the word of God becomes actively present within believers, issuing forth in profession and loving practice, and thus creating the uh, ecclesial communion with God. So to remember what was heard from the beginning is to direct the church's attention to the indwelling word of God who makes it to be the church in the first place. It is to live and remain in communion with God. It is to allow the power of the indwelling word to become active and manifest by empowering and shaping lives of holiness, lives of professed faith and agapic love. Accordingly, 
John also identifies the love command as part of what his ecclesial audience heard from the beginning. The love command in 1 John cannot be understood apart from the death of Jesus on the cross, the proper understanding of which is given in the apostolic testimony. As John writes in 316, this is the first John 316, not the gospel, quote, in this we have known love, that he laid down his life for us, we also ought to lay down our lives for the brothers, end quote. So the faith recognition of the love of God, which Jesus' death reveals, gives rise to Christians', Christians excuse me, loving practices toward each other and thus manifest their communion with God. And now Ratzinger articulates well these basic dynamics given in 1 John, uh, specifically in his essay, Eucharist, Communio, and Solidarity. So this quote is from Ratzinger. This communion with the living God, John tells us, brings man into the light. He can now see and lives in the light, that is, in the truth of God, which is expressed in the one new all-encompassing commandment, the commandment to love. And so communion with the word of life automatically becomes righteous living. It becomes love. Furthermore, it becomes communion with one another, end quote. So when John exhorts his audience to remember the love command, he makes clear that the love command is something which they already know. And the proper understanding of that love command also comes to them in the apostolic testimony. Now, the paranetic appeal to what is already known serves the purpose of encouraging the ad audience to adopt certain practices. So John is directing his audience to remember the indwelling word because this word not only informs but also empowers Christiform agapic love. The revelatory word which believers heard from the beginning provides them with the proper instruction, example, and ability to love in a godly way. And by focusing attention and contemplation onto the revealed word proclaimed, ecclesial remembering serves the promotion of Christiform loving practice by Christians. Lastly, John exhorts his audience to remember the eschatological teaching about the Antichrist. He does so on account of the problem of false teachers and heretical doctrines circulating in Johannine precincts. First and second John give evidence that some have broken communion with the Johannine network of churches over primarily Christology. Without overreading these letters, there are indications that these secessionists, quote, as Raymond Brown calls them, deny the reality and or salvific efficacy of Jesus' humanity. One of the reasons why John lays on thick all the sensory language in the proem. In both 1st and 2nd John, the author describes these false teachers with verbs related to the Greek verb planao. We get planet from it, which means to lead astray. This verb is significant, for it is used in the Septuagint and elsewhere in the New Testament to designate the activity of a false prophet. He or she leads astray the people of God. And thus it should not be surprising, therefore, that John calls the secessionists false prophets in 4.1 and identifies the spirit which speaks through them as, quote, the spirit of the Antichrist in verse uh, four three, and the spirit of deception in 4.6. So whatever the particulars of the secessionists' heretical Christology might be, John makes plain that the threat of being deceived and being led astray by false teaching is a real danger for his ecclesial audience. Thus in 2, uh, 26, John expresses this point plainly, quote, I wrote to you about the ones who would lead you astray, end quote. This may actually be an allusion to 2 John. Okay, 2 John may actually have preceded the composition of 1 John. The canonical order is not necessarily the historical order of composition. But that's for another day. For John, proper ecclesial remembering of the revealed word serves as a bulwark against being taken in by false teachers and false doctrines. The revealed word proclaimed by John and activated in believers by the Spirit provides a criterion of spiritual discernment, 
Quote from 4.2, in this way, you know the spirit of God. Every spirit which confesses Jesus Christ having come in the flesh is from God, and every spirit which does not confess Jesus is not from God, end quote. So in this situation created by false prophets, the need to remember well the revealed word has bearing on people's communion with God and with each other. As we have seen, to receive faithfully the apostolic proclamation of the revealed word correlates with communion with John and also with the Father and the Son. But conversely, to repudiate the revealed word given in John's testimony is to break communion with John and thus also with the Father and the Son. By repudiating John's teaching, the secessionists thus constitute a negative example, an example, that is, of repudiating the revealed word and breaking communion. So John thus exhorts his audience to remember his eschatological teaching about Antichrist so that they might remain faithful to what John received from Jesus, proclaim to them, and so that they might not be taken in by false teaching and teachers, and in this way may preserve their communion with John and with the Father and the Son. So in conclusion, these reflections on ecclesial remembrance as a Christian practice in 1 John serve, I hope, to complement Dr. Waldstein's presentations on the Eucharistic dimensions of ecclesial remembrance in the Gospel of John. These presentations underscore the vital importance of ecclesial memory to the nature and life of the church as such, and as expounded in the ecclesiology of Joseph Ratzinger. For that which is to be remembered is nothing other than the word of God himself, Christ himself, whether he comes to us substantially in the sacrament of the Eucharist or in the inspired apostolic testimony. Ratzinger identifies the heart of the church as communion with the sacramental encounter with Christ in the Eucharist, as many of our talks have uh, identified. But could we not also explore and think theologically about the encounter with Christ in the apostolic testimony, preserved in the scriptures, as similarly, though not identically, also existing at the heart of church as communion? If, has been mentioned in previous presentations, the church lives from the Eucharist, might we not also think about how the church similarly learns from the scriptures when they are read in vibrant ecclesial faith and love and with a healthy account of human reason, as Dr. Waldstein has called our attention to in, as um, with reference to the Ravensburg lecture. For as Dave Erbom reads, quote, the church has always venerated the divine scriptures just as she has venerated the body of the Lord. Since especially in the sacred liturgy, she unceasingly receives and offers to the faithful the bread of life from the table of both God's word and Christ's body. This reminds me of uh, Henri de Lubac's identification of both Eucharist and scripture as incorporations of the Logos, de Lubac's uh, phrasing. Now, this same word of God sounds out to us today through the historically past course discourse of the first letter of John, summoning us to recall what we ourselves have heard from the beginning. For if we so attend to the revealed word proclaimed, which indwells us by faith, John tells us, and I'll end with three quotes from the letter, we will, quote, remain in the Father and in the Son. 224, that we may know the difference between, quote, the spirit of truth and the spirit of deception, 4.6. And we may, as he writes in 3.23, quote, believe in the name of God's Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. Thank, end quote. Thank you very much. <laughs>